Now we're going to look at deriving the Hamiltonian for many electron atoms. So all of the models that we've dealt with up to this point, so we've dealt with the harmonic oscillator, the particle in a box, all that stuff, up to the hydrogenic atom, those, those Hamiltonians through the Schrodinger equation, they can actually be derived exper uh, analytically with techniques that you might learn in a partial differential equations course. They're complicated sometimes, but they can be done. When we get to situations where there's many electron atoms, these can no longer be solved analytically. You pretty much have to have computers to do this. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't set up the Hamiltonian. All right, so forget all this stuff at the top first. Let me explain to you what the Hamiltonian for multi-electron atoms or many electron atoms. So helium is a many electron atom because it has more than one electron. So you have a, a nucleus in the center with more than one proton, although this is just one particle because the protons are so close together that you can really just treat it as one particle. Okay, And in the case of helium, it has a charge of plus two, basically for each proton, one for each. And it's surrounded by two electrons that each are some distance from the nucleus and they are a distance from each other. So the subscripts are really important here. So this is our first electron, E1. It's therefore a distance from the nucleus, R1. Here's our other electron, E2. It is a distance from the nucleus, R2. And then if you want to talk about the distance between electrons, you put R and the two subscripts that correspond to each electron. So this is electron 1 and electron 2, so their distance is R1, 2. If we were dealing with lithium, which we'll do in the next video as an example, and we had a third electron, we could have R13, we could have R23, and then we would still have an R12. So you can see that with every electron that's added, you get increasingly complicated in your Hamiltonian. All right, so the Hamiltonian is really just the sum of three things, and each of these things can have multiple terms. So you have the kinetic energy of each electron. So the, uh, the nucleus doesn't move. We assume that even though the atom can be moving all around and so forth, the nucleus is static. The atom is static, so the nucleus is static, and only the electrons move relative to the nucleus. So the nucleus has no kinetic energy, but the electrons do have kinetic energy. Notice that the kinetic energy terms are all going to be negative, um, because kinetic energy is a sort of favorable energy, and so therefore it's negative. Negative energies are typically uh, favorable. Okay. We also have to add on the attractions, and the only attractions here we have are between the nucleus and each electron, okay, because they're oppositely charged, therefore you should have a favorable columbic potential energy between each electron and the nucleus. And notice also those are negative as well, okay, because attractive forces or attractive potential energies are favorable. The last term is our electron-electron repulsion term, which is going to be positive, and that's the columbic potential energy between two electrons. Okay, And you're just going to add all of these up, and that's your Hamiltonian, which you'd need a computer to solve analytically. Now, what is the electrostatic potential energy between any two particles? Well, let's look at this case. If we're talking about between the nucleus and the electron, then we use this term. It's going to be negative z e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 divided by r. Okay, what does that mean? z is the charge of the nucleus. So the charge is 2, so in the case of helium, this would be a 2. If you're dealing with lithium, it would, z would be a 3. If we were dealing with carbon, z would be a 6. Okay, so z is just your atomic charge. What is the nuclear charge of that atom? E is a constant. E is just the charge of an electron, basically. It's the fundamental charge unit because charge is quantized. So E is going to be 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, and you'd have to square that. This whole thing, 4 pi epsilon 0, this is actually just a constant. It turns out that 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, this is your coulombs constant, K, and it turns out that this quotient is approximately 9 times 10 to the 9th. Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Typically, though, we're not actually getting a number here. We're just setting it up. So we usually just leave it as over 4 pi epsilon 0, and then r is the particular r that we're dealing with. So my first potential energy term, which is our attraction term between E1 and the nucleus, is going to be given by negative 2, which is the charge of the helium nucleus, times E squared, 
divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 divided by r1, which is the distance between the first electron and the nucleus. By a similar argument, the second potential energy term, which is also attractive, is going to be negative 2 e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, and then the distance between electron 2 and the nucleus is r2. So those are pretty straightforward. Now, when you do it, the repulsion terms, the only repulsion terms we have are between electrons. So in this case, we have repulsion, a repulsive potential energy between E1 and E2. Their distance is R12, okay? So that repulsive force is given by only E squared, and it's positive, okay? It's only E squared because there's no repulsion with the nucleus. Each of these has a fundamental charge of one. So technically you could put a one right here, but it's not necessary. So electron-electron repulsions will never have a number in front of the E squared. This is gonna be E squared over four pi epsilon zero divided by R one two, all right? And so what we do then is we simply add up all of those. So let's look at our kinetic energy. So each electron has a kinetic energy. So there's two electrons. So we're gonna have two kinetic energy terms. So it's gonna be negative h bar squared over two mass of the electron times the Laplacian operator for the first, the first electron, okay? Plus a negative or just minus h bar squared over two me times the Laplacian for the second electron. If we were dealing with lithium, like I said, we'll do that in the next video, you'd have a third term for kinetic energy. Okay, and you only have a term for the electrons, not the nucleus, because the nucleus is considered to be static. Now we add on the potential, or excuse me, the, uh, yeah, the potential energy terms for the attractions. They're also negative, so we determined that they were negative 2e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 r1 minus 2e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 r2. Okay, and again, we have two electrons, so there's two attractive terms, okay? Each electron's attracted to the nucleus. Then we have our electron-electron repulsion term. So this is just gonna be E squared over four pi epsilon zero R12, all right? And this is the only one that's gonna be positive over here. All the others are essentially negative, okay? And this is gonna be your Hamiltonian for a helium atom. If we then go to a lithium atom or even bigger atoms, your Hamiltonian is going to become much larger because you're going to have more electrons, so you're going to have more of these terms, one for each electron, also one kinetic energy term for each electron, but then your repulsion component is going to become increasingly more complicated. If we were to just add one more electron, we're going to have three repulsion terms. If we add us, if we had two more, you can imagine we're going to have to have even more than that. Okay, so join us in the next video whenever I talk about uh, the Hamiltonian for, say, a lithium atom. But this is the theory behind how you do this. Uh, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Again, we're going to do the lithium atom in the next video. Thank you.